It was tragedy on an extraordinary scale. A quake so powerful, it knocked the Earth off its axis. Tens of thousands dead. The whole of Japan shifted three meters out to sea. Parts of the coast dropped over a meter. What were the forces that came together to create this horrifying disaster? A team of scientists is investigating. Never before have we had such a, a surplus of data. There are no mysteries in this earthquake. We know exactly what happened. Japan's coast lies in ruins. Incredibly, it could have been even worse. This is the untold story of how science saved lives and how scientists are piecing together exactly what happened. Professor Roger Billum is a world-leading earthquake expert. He's in Japan to witness the immediate aftermath. So we're flying right over the coast right now, and the, much of the coast has uh, sunk about a meter. The extent of the damage is truly amazing. The tsunami picked up everything in its path, cars, houses, warehouses, and just tumbled them relentlessly inland, on and on and on. One of the things I'd like to see is exactly how far it went, what kind of debris get, gets left behind on these gigantic tsunamis. Billum is the first geologist to conduct an aerial survey of the damage. Every detail of the disaster has been recorded by seismometers, strain gauges and tidal gauges, allowing experts to analyze exactly what happened. But this was first and foremost a human tragedy on an unimaginable scale. <laughs> it ripped away much of Japan's infrastructure. One of the world's most developed nations brought to its knees. As rescue workers pick through the debris, Billum and other scientists around the world take on the challenge of understanding the massive earthquake in the hope of one day avoiding such loss of life. The source of the disaster lay 100 kilometers off the coast. Beneath six kilometers of water, the Earth was distorting, a vast, slow-motion collision. The Earth's crust is made up of several continent-sized slabs of rock, tectonic plates. Japan lies on a boundary between these plates. The Pacific Plate is ramming into it at eight centimeters a year, about the same speed your fingernails grow. The Pacific Plate drives underneath it, snagging and catching as it goes. The plate that Japan sits on compresses and buckles under the strain. Over decades and centuries, immense stresses build up. The energy that drove this earthquake had been building up for a couple of hundred years caused by the movement of the Pacific Plate towards the Eurasian Plate. Uh, think of it as a giant elastic band that's being wound up for 200 years. On March the 11th, 2011, at 2.46 p.m. Japanese time, the stresses reached breaking point. The amount of energy released in an earthquake of this size is really huge, and uh, you have to measure it in large units. If you take the atomic bomb that devastated Hiroshima, this event was probably two million of those, a really huge amount of energy. Shockwaves radiated out. The fastest 
known as P waves, traveled at six kilometers a second. Japan's detection systems picked them up instantly. Within seconds before anyone realized what was going on, automatic warnings flashed across the country. A computer-generated announcement even interrupted a Japanese parliament broadcast. By the time the warning system kicked in, the coastal city of Sendai, just 130 kilometers from where the earthquake originated, was shaking. The slower but more destructive shock waves, called S-waves, had now arrived. These waves travel at three kilometers a second. They threw northeast Japan into chaos. As the shock waves raced outward, 150 kilometers southwest of the epicenter, they slammed past Fukushima Daiichi, an aging nuclear power station housing six reactors and generating four and a half gigawatts of electricity for the local grid. This footage from a town near the reactor give some idea of the earthquake's power. Japan's warning system had automatically shut down the reactors. Cooling them would take time. When you think shutdown, you think, ah, you know, uh, it's, the danger's gone because it's shut down. But the reactor core was still extremely hot. You know, if you have a pan in the oven and you shut the oven off, that oven continues to heat inside even after you've turned it off. After shutdown, emergency diesel generators kicked in to pump coolant through the reactor cores. Fukushima survived the earthquake intact, but there was one big problem. It stands just meters from the sea. 11,000 kilometers away at the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center in Hawaii, staff got emergency pager messages. Within 10 seconds of the earthquake starting, its effects were already being monitored around the world. Japan has lots of seismometers, so there was a lot of information fast. So the earthquake was still going on when we got our page. First indications, a magnitude of around seven. But as data flooded in, the figures started to climb. 7.5, 7.7, 7.8, 7 .7, up into the eights. The immediate reaction of everybody was, that's not right. Because in the history of Japan, there has never been an earthquake larger than 8.4. Really heightened our, in the intensity of what we were doing because we knew we were dealing with something very big and something that could affect the whole Pacific Basin. We realized, oh, this is it. Um, and, and then immediately you realize, this is horrible for Japan. 100 seconds since the fault line slipped. The slowest moving but most destructive S waves reached Tokyo. With 60 seconds warning, Tokyo was already braced. But not for this. The quake lasted an unprecedented five minutes. One American geologist was in the city that day. We expected it to end after 10, 15, 20 seconds, something like that, maybe a minute at the most. About minute three or four, we were just all kind of astonished that it just kept going and going and going. 
What is different about a big earthquake is that it begins, but it doesn't stop. We're just looking at each other going, is this over yet? And no, it's not, it's still going. It was kind of a growing realization that it was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it had to be fairly close. In a nearby park, an American tourist found the ground opening up at his feet. No one has ever filmed this happening before. The footage reveals a characteristic of earthquakes, liquefaction. As the ground is compressed, water is squeezed and forced to the surface. Okay, we have earthquake right now, and this is actually moving. You see the cracks moving? That crack was not there. The crack is getting bigger and smaller, going back and forth. And there is water coming up all over in the park right now. This Here's a huge crack, and it's still moving. It's just going back and forth, swaying. It's making me kind of nervous. This land could just go, potentially. I don't know. In the days to come, scientists would regrade this quake as a magnitude 9. The warning systems worked, and most buildings were still standing. But even before the quake had finished, everyone in Japan knew worse was to come. There were only minutes before a tsunami would arrive. The question now was how many would escape in time. On March the 11th, 2011, the billions Tokyo had invested in quake-proof engineering and early warning systems proved their worth. They saved the city's structures and its people. Then, the tsunami struck. The tsunami was triggered by the explosive energy release of the earthquake, 100 kilometers off the coast. What caused it? Over centuries, the Japanese side of the tectonic fault line had been compressed and dragged downwards by the Pacific plate driving beneath it. The whole upper plate behaves just basically like a rubber block. It just compresses and like a spring like this. And when the earthquake happens, it springs back. The sudden upward flip of such a huge slab of rock lifted a six kilometer deep mass of water upwards to the surface of the sea. As it collapsed back, immense waves raced out across the ocean. Not like normal sea waves, more like shock waves from an explosion. Just a metre high, but over a hundred kilometres from front to back, and travelling at terrifying speed. The energy heaved up the sea floor. That displaced vast amount of water that, that we can see made it its way on land, it made its way off around the Pacific. One side of the wave hurtled out across the Pacific. The other side raced towards the coast of Japan. Tsunamis travel very fast at a speed that depends on the water depth. And because in the deep ocean, tsunami travels very fast, reaching at times the speed 
of a jet aircraft. At over 800 kilometers per hour, the wave took just minutes to reach the coast. Here, the shallower sea floor slowed down the front of the wave. The wave's fast-moving rear was still racing in. It began to catch up with the front. The increasing pressure pushed the seawater up into a rising swell. Five kilometers out to sea, a Coast Guard crew captured this extraordinary footage. The tsunami rearing up as the water beneath it grew shallower. Then, when they crested the first wave, a second loomed behind. The swell became a breaking wave as the rear of the wave continues to pile in, sucking in the sea ahead of it. The very first thing that seems to have happened is that the sea left the land, and some of the footage we, we've seen shows uh, a huge shoreline being exposed. And then the tsunami built up offshore, and the dynamics of the wave carried it inland. Um, probably a cubic kilometer of water just, just splashed uh, uh, landward and kept going until it ran out of steam. These remarkable pictures caught the moment when the sea pulled back as the first wave roared in. The tsunami had arrived. The wave's effect was strangely unpredictable. At first glance, it seemed there was no discernible pattern to where it struck and when. First came Ofunatu in the north. Then Sendai to the south. And Miyako in the north again. Measurements from tsunami monitoring stations along the coast were equally puzzling. The height of the wave varied dramatically from town to town. But why? The varying depth of the seabed was partly to blame. Where the water was deeper, the tsunami traveled faster and reached land more quickly. Another factor is the complex detail of cliffs, bays and inlets along the shoreline. It boils down to how the wave is focused and defocused by the geography or the topography of the coastline itself. This is Ofunato, where the wave hit first. Deep water off the coast offered little resistance to the wave. Tsunami warnings did sound, but here there was little time to get to higher ground. The best early warning system people would have had would have been the fact that there was an earthquake. And people have got used to the fact that if you have an earthquake, there is a possibility of a tsunami that will follow. But in the timescale they had, there was very little time or very little opportunity for escape. The tsunami hit Ofunato just 20 minutes after the earthquake. Water that actually hit the coast will be well in excess of a billion, probably 10 billion tons of water. That's a little bit like taking a million swimming pools and just emptying them onto the coastal areas of northeast Japan. Fifteen minutes later, the tsunami hit Sendai, 116 kilometers south. The area around the city is mostly farmland, low-lying, fertile and flat. That's why the tsunami barely slowed as it smashed ashore. The flat land was perfect for an airport, too. It opened just four years ago. A kilometre from the coast, it was deluged. It hits very low-lying areas. There's nothing to stop it moving inland, and so it can move inland um, six, seven kilometers without being impeded. 
is there's not much to slow it down, and because the wavelength of the, of the tsunami is so big, it's, it's not going to stop unless, until it reaches something, uh, reaches some sort of high ground, and it'll just keep on coming. Next to be hit was the Miyako coast, 180 kilometers back to the north. What happened here highlights another mystery. The area had good tsunami defenses. The residents were prepared. They should have been safe. Last time a tsunami hit here was half a century ago. In the aftermath of that tsunami, they built these 10 meter high seawalls far higher than anyone thought they would need. Tsunami drills became a regular feature of life. Everyone knew what to do when the sirens sounded. On March the 11th, all along the coast, the sirens did sound, this time for real. Go to the hill. A tsunami was coming. This was not a drill. You hear the sirens? There's a hill outside of town that we're uh, going to try to get to. Uh, well, it's a precautionary measure, but uh, I mean, you know, you never know. This this uh, town has a lot of history with tsunamis and a lot of death from it, so they're taking it pretty seriously, obviously. The warning saved the lives of some. This footage captures the moments after the sirens sounded. Here it comes! The tsunami breached the coastal defences. Miyako's high walls proved useless. Countless people died here. The tsunami was 10 meters high. Why did their 10 meter high walls fail to stop it? With thousands of sensors along the coastline, the scientists already have part of the answer. The fact that the shoreline has actually subsided means that the sea had plenty of space to go and it, it basically filled up the empty space left by the sinking. Several villages have just been completely ruined with no survivors and the human death toll is obviously going to be up in the tens of thousands when, when the final count is in. The data from the sensors had revealed something incredible. The earthquake had caused the whole coastline to drop by up to a meter, lowering Miyako's walls, making the tsunami much worse. All along the coast, subsidence put towns in danger. You've got the tsunami wave coming in on top of what would be uh, a, essentially a two meter higher vacuum of subsided land as it, as it sweeps in. And there's not much to stop it until it hits, a, hits higher ground somewhere. But most at risk was the shut down nuclear power plant of Fukushima. It had survived the earthquake. And here too, there was a 5.6 meter defense wall, but now it had sunk over half a meter. 40 minutes after the quake, the wave smashed over the wall and flooded the diesel generators that were cooling the reactor cores. Backup batteries kicked in, batteries with just an eight hour charge.
with thousands already confirmed dead. And now the threat of a nuclear disaster. Japan was in crisis. At 2.46 on Friday the 11th of March, Japan experienced its most powerful earthquake for a thousand years. A magnitude nine quake shattered the land. Then a huge tsunami engulfed it. Overnight, fires raged across a sea-flooded wasteland. Oil from factories and gas from ruptured lines set hundreds of square kilometers of debris ablaze. In Tokyo, the train system was paralyzed. Millions bedded down in offices and waited for dawn. Meanwhile, the tsunami wave was still spreading across the ocean at 800 kilometers an hour. Countries all around the Pacific Rim were watching the situation nervously. In Hawaii, the Tsunami Warning Center was on full alert. Very quickly, we realized that, that this, was, this was basically the first big ocean crossing tsunami um, that had happened in 40 years. Frantically, they were trying to work out when and where the wave would strike next. At that point, we went to a Pacific-wide warning, which means another message, and now lots and lots of phone calls. State warning point. This is the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. Hawaii issued an evacuation alert. People headed to higher ground. The wave that hit was one meter high. It caused damage, but thankfully the distance had weakened the wave. This time, no lives were lost. <laughs> With the wave now fading, countries around the Pacific downgraded their alerts. But Japan awoke to a nightmare. Different parts of the shoreline had suffered different effects. Channel 4 journalist Callum McRae set off along the Japanese coast to compare the levels of destruction and discover how far-reaching the damage of the tsunami was. He was the first journalist to reach the isolated mountain community of Kahoku. We are up in the mountains, eight kilometers from the coast. And what's happened here is that the tsunami has created a huge surge, which has climbed all the way up the river uh, and then flooded here. Amazingly, this lake of seawater is meters above sea level. あたりから、やっぱり登り始めて。夜の時登って。そして夜の順に登ってきてね、知らないでいる順にもうここに水乗ってたわけです。次の日からね。それからずっと引かないでそのまま。なってんだね。もう、え、もう私たちも仙台から
That's just so strange. Closer to the shore, it was a different story. And as if Ofenate didn't have enough problems, scientists reckon that this whole area, this region, has subsided uh, well over a metre. And in the next couple of days, the region's also expecting the highest tides of the year. The sea is some 500 meters down there, um, and yet up here we have this. It's a remarkable sight by any standards, a huge tug which has been brought all the way up here by the tsunami. Um, and what's remarkable about it, or what's even more remarkable about it, is that, that uh, what it says about the size of the tsunami. Because the Japan Meteorological Center have just produced provisional estimates saying that the tsunami that hit this region was about three and a half meters high. Uh, now, we are seven, eight metres above sea level here, uh, and even given the surge, the fact that it could bring that all the way up here does suggest that the tsunami here was a lot higher than three and a half metres. Even amidst such chaos, this seems strange. Boats, trucks and cars were dumped on top of buildings, much higher than the recorded height of the wave. That happens because as the water's pushing through restricted areas like the streets of towns and villages, it's being effectively funneled. And the water's got to go somewhere, and so it goes up as it's squeezed and funneled and pushes material, pushes cars onto roofs, sometimes as high as 50 feet. So in areas, the, the impact of this will be even greater, particularly where you get narrow streets. Once the wave starts to pick up, uh, part of a town, the, the warehouses along the dock, the debris and all that, then it becomes more like a glacier. You know, it's a, it's a moving wall of debris. And the more mass it has, the more power it has as it comes in. It doesn't really look like water beyond some point. It looks like the entire town is flowing in, and, and it is. So all the mass of all the buildings, cars, refrigerators, and everything that's in that wall, it's essentially a debris glacier at that point, and it just keeps coming in. This is Minami Sanriku, a town that was wiped off the map. Ninety-five percent of the buildings destroyed. Over 10,000 people, half the population missing. This place, Minami San Luco, probably symbolizes the tragedy more than anywhere. An entire town wiped out by the force of nature. It's almost difficult to imagine one's thoughts as one sees this coming towards you. And as it hits the coast, it's then picking up all the debris, it's picking up buildings, cars and things, and you then end up with this sort of really quite horrific mass moving through towns, villages, across fields, causing complete destruction. I mean, it would be bad enough if it was only water, uh, but because it's full of cars and you can't, you can't swim against it or flow with it or do anything, you're just in a, like in front of a bulldozer of, of moving the entire town. It's funny that when you hear that sound of an ambulance, it kind of uh, actually gives you hope that they might have found somebody alive. Although that must be happening fewer and fewer times between anyone who did survive and was trapped would almost certainly have died of hypothermia by now. At the town of Rikuzen Takata, rescue workers hunt for survivors and discover the dead. When they find a body, they put a large stick in the ground with a flag attached to it so that it can be recovered later. It's a fairly 
Do some inside task. In fact, they're not just collecting bodies, they're also collecting personal mementos as well, which they find, um, like this. I'm afraid what we have here is more bodies waiting to be taken away. Even now, the tsunami was not finished with Japan. Back at the Fukushima power plant, what started as a failed generator was fast becoming the biggest nuclear crisis since Chernobyl. We'll keep the windows closed and uh, I'll put on a mask. Scientists have already gathered more data from Japan's earthquake and tsunami than from any other disaster in history. As Professor Roger Billum returns to Tokyo from his aerial survey, the city's vulnerability becomes all too clear. There are 30 million people within a about two meters of sea level, and uh, a tsunami here, of course, would be absolutely devastating. Suddenly, a problem. We had a big earthquake just now, so... Really? Yeah. We've just learned from the ground that there was an earthquake that damaged the heli heliport. They're checking for damage right now. We don't know how big the earthquake was, but it was obviously a, a very uh, a nearby aftershock. A massive aftershock has hit Tokyo. Magnitude 6.2. In the week that followed the main quake, there were over 500 aftershocks along the fault. This is the actual data from seismometers around Japan. The larger the circle, the bigger the aftershock. The shaking is now stopped, so I'll just continue landing. Finally, Billum's helicopter is given the all-clear to land. Even at the heliport in Tokyo, the damage is plain to see. I've noticed that the tarmac here, which should be beautifully dark everywhere, in fact, stained white in places, and you can see that, in fact, sand has come out of this crack, and there's another one over there, another one over there. We're very close to the shoreline, and the lurching motion of the uh, ground during the earthquake has caused the subsurface liquefied sands to come belching out on the top. Precisely the same phenomenon, liquefaction, that was filmed during the earthquake. And over here is an old mud volcano. Um, uh, old, it's about three days old. You can see how the mud came pouring out of the top there. So look, we're 200 miles from the epicenter here, and here's a crack in uh, uh, the heliport landing area. It, it continues all the way along here. You can actually see down about uh, three feet in places. Uh, splits into two here. This goes over here. You can see an offset in the... Um, in this uh, trim around the, uh, the tarmac. As the Earth's crust shattered during the main quake, new stresses spread along the fault. Relieve the pressure in one place, and it builds up elsewhere, triggering aftershocks. What you're seeing here is how those aftershocks happened over a period of about a week after the main shock. And that orange region, delineated by those orange dots, uh, essentially gives you a feeling for the uh, area of the fault uh, along the plate boundary that ruptured in this event. Every aftershock takes its toll on an already frightened population. Journalist Callum McRae has been moved by the plight of the people here. In the regional capital of Sendai, the temporary shelters are full.
but in a darkened, ravaged city. It seems one person at least is trying to cling to normality. We're in Sendai, three or four hundred meters from the shorefront in a, in a scene of apocalyptic chaos. Uh, it's cold, it's dark, there's no power anywhere. And yet, up there in that abandoned block of flats, on the top floor, there's one light. One man, one family perhaps, trying to survive in, in this chaos. the following day on the road back to Tokyo. The arterial road that connects the north and south is empty. A reminder of the damage this disaster has done and is still doing. This is already one of the worst nuclear accidents in history if it stops right now. And we're dealing with multiple meltdown possibilities. Two radioactive substances, cesium and iodine, were detected near the number one reactor at the plant on Saturday. The um, Fukushima uh, nuclear base is about 60 kilometers that way. That's about 38 miles or so, I think. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we've got the windows closed. We're driving fast. Um, who knows whether it's safe? Uh, the advice is very conflicting. The American government says that uh, uh, has put an exclusion zone of 80 kilometers. Uh, and of course, we're well within that. On the other hand, the Japanese government say it's fine as long as it's more than 30 kilometers away. So, I mean, you can tell, nobody knows. Um, but uh, we'll keep the windows closed and uh, I'll put on a mask. Mask. Looks good, huh? The danger posed by the Fukushima nuclear plant remains unresolved. Meanwhile, scientists have started to analyze the startling number of aftershocks that are still rattling Japan. That main shock was followed by hundreds of magnitude fives and dozens of magnitude six earthquakes and a handful of magnitude sevens. Once you had a, a, a pattern of a, an earthquake happening, followed by a bigger one, you never know whether it's going to happen again. Japan's earthquake warning systems did and will save lives. The Hawaii tsunami warning system also saved thousands. As the tsunami crossed the ocean, the warning center monitored it all the way. Here it is here. Ah. We couldn't um let our guard down because, of course, the tsunami has continued on and we have, a, we have a continuing responsibility to the rest of the Pacific. Even though the tsunami lost most of its energy as it crossed the ocean, the scientists had been able to warn the world. As the tsunami spread across the ocean, at location after location, we realized, oh, the, our predictions are pretty darn good. Because people were warned, there was very little destruction or damage, certainly to human life. One person did lose their life, their life uh, in, in California, north of Crescent Bay, because they rushed down to the beach to take photos of the tsunamis that came in. In Japan, the humanitarian disaster continues. Estimates put the death toll from the quake and tsunami at over 20,000. Rebuilding will take generations. For scientists, the analysis continues. From all the data they have acquired, one threat is still very clear. Experts have warned of a large quake and tsunami off the coast near Tokyo for years. The fault lines under the ocean to the south of Tokyo are dangerously stressed. But this time, the earthquake happened in the north. What's been expected is slip of the Philippine plate relative to the, north, uh, the Eurasian plate. Um, and what has actually occurred is slip of the Pacific plate relative to the uh, Eurasian plate. Sometimes a great earthquake will cause the next patch of the plate boundary to slip. So all eyes are on, uh, on what's happening, how this earthquake has stressed the neighboring part of the, the plate boundary. You've got to understand this, this whole region is in a, a very high state of stress and it's ready to go. And, and they've been expected to go any minute. So this recent earthquake is going to have brought that closer. Uh, the question is how much closer? When an earthquake like this happens, 
it, it basically all of the stress that it relieves in the Earth's crust essentially gets transferred somewhere else. It doesn't go away. It actually adds loading to other parts of the crust. The densest areas of population survived largely unscathed. Next time could be different. One area of extreme concern is Tokyo, the world's largest city. There could be a, a major event in Tokyo that would be extremely damaging to this very densely populated region. If you were going to choose somewhere to put one of the, the major industrial economies on the planet, that part of the Pacific Rim is not the place you would choose. It could be happening as we speak, or it might not happen for a decade. The critical thing is, has this particular earthquake shaken that region up so that it brings forward the, the timing of that earthquake? It's foolish to think that we can stop natural phenomena. What we've got to do is to learn to live with them and minimize the consequences when they happen and minimize also the recovery time. It's very difficult for science to protect against earthquakes and tsunamis. What science can do is help town planners, engineers to make buildings stronger, to make designs of buildings and cities more resilient. We cannot stop these things happening. We can't prevent it we can prepare for it.